So today we're going to be playing Clubhouse Games, or as it's known in Europe, 42 All-Time Classics. As you might infer from the title, it's a compilation of 42 card, board, and parlor games. Now with my playthrough of Uno and Quadradius, I said that I'm pretty harsh on adaptation games, video games specifically designed to replicate things that you can play in the real world, or with Tabletop Simulator. But let's try and give this game a fair shake. Clubhouse Games has a free play mode where you play any of the games you want to, barring some that need to be unlocked. There's a mission mode where you try to accomplish challenges in various games. And then there's this game's uh, story mode, I guess. It's called Stamp Mode, where you gotta play through all the games in a long sequence. Playing through it will unlock the remaining free play games, and normal and hard mode. I would be playing normal mode, but easy mode is the only one they let you play from the start. And considering this game isn't supposed to be a challenge, uh, easy mode will do fine for now. I'm judging Clubhouse games based on its variety. So let's play stamp mode and we'll go through every single one of the games, all 42 of them. This should be fun. Hopefully I'm not being sarcastic right now. So the first game in the sequence is Old Maid, and already we're off to a bad start. It's not that Old Maid is a bad game or that Clubhouse games shouldn't have included it, although I personally prefer Go Fish, but in Old Maid, the goal of the game is to try to get other players to take the cards you don't want, or the Queen, the Old Maid. It's a game that more or less requires bluffing, and you can't bluff against a computer. At least, not with DS technology. So essentially, you're taking random cards while the computer takes random cards. You can, like, hold one card out in front, but, but that doesn't affect anything. This game, as far as stamp mode is concerned, is entirely luck-based. And it's the first game in the sequence. I guess that brings up Clubhouse Games is definitely strongest with other human players. But I don't have them right now, and Stamp Mode exists for a reason. Not only that, but you have to play through Stamp Mode to unlock the remaining games. So I do feel comfortable judging Clubhouse Games based on its Stamp Mode. Game 2, Soda Shake. This game is kind of like Russian Roulette with strategy. It's interesting. Four players pass around a bottle, shaking it up. If it explodes on you, then you lose and everyone else wins. It's a simple game, but there is some depth to it. Not much, but some. Basically, the more you shake it up, the more likely you're both to lose and get the next player to lose as well. I think that's random to how much pressure it takes to explode, but I can usually win this one on my first try, so I, I don't know. This next game is called Spit. I have never heard of this card game before, but Clubhouse Games does have something very handy that really plays to its favor. If you don't know how to play any one of these games, every game has easily accessible rules. So if anything else, Clubhouse Games is a really good teaching tool for some of the more obscure games that people might not have played. Because I didn't know how to play this game the first time around, I did lose on my first way through. But Stamp Mode is actually really merciful, and it helps mitigate some of the luck-based issues. If you win a game, you get all three stamps, allowing you to go to the next game immediately. If you lose, however, you still get at least one stamp, so you won't be stuck on one game you hate or still can't figure out forever. It's not a perfect system, as you're still going to be playing those games longer than the ones you just get the hang of quickly, but it is a nice mercy mechanic for people who just want to unlock the missing games. Anyway, as for Spit, you play cards in sequential order. If there's a 5 on one of the decks, you could play a 6 or a 4. If no one can play something, the top cards on both players' decks are placed on the discard pile. First player to play all their cards wins, so be quick because this one isn't turn-based. Game 4, Dots and Boxes. This is a game that you'll see on kids' menus everywhere. Every turn one player draws a line from dot to dot with the goal of making squares. The player with the most squares wins. On higher levels, the AI for this one gets rather insane, so good luck. On easy though, they're really kind of stupid. Game 5, I'm really happy that this compilation has this particular game because it's actually kind of rare for even the most dedicated compilation games. That's because this game is traditionally known by its title, Bullshit. Neopets had it and included it under the name Cheat, and here it's under the name I Doubt It, but anyone who has ever played this game in the real world knows that it's called Bullshit. So cards are played in sequential order, twos, threes, fours, so on. On your turn, you could play all of the cards that meet that criteria, or you could lie and put down whatever you want. However, if someone doesn't trust that you're being honest, they call Bullshit. If they were right and you were lying, you draw all of the cards. If they call wrong, they draw all the cards. The goal is to empty your hand. However, like Old Maid, this game just isn't the same against computer players. At least ones without personality. I mean, first of all, the computer players will always call bullshit on your last play, so you have to make sure that that one at least is honest. But secondly, I was able to beat this game without bullshitting once. It's a game that requires bluffing and learning tells, so save it for multiplayer mode. Game 6 is Sevens which is another game that Clubhouse Games introduced me to. Four players, the deck is dealt out evenly among them. 
Then the sevens are placed in the center. You take turns trying to empty out your hand. You do this by playing the next card in the stack. So at the start, you can only play a six or an eight of each suit. If the eight is played, you can then play a nine and so on. It really sucks if you got the twos or the aces. Although it's not like the game is impossible unless you've got all of them. It's a game of a bit of strategy and screwing people over. If the highest diamonds you have is a 9, for instance, don't play the 9 of diamonds until you can't do anything else, preventing anyone else who has a higher diamonds card from playing theirs. Let's just say if you play this one in multiplayer, you probably are going to lose friends. Game 7. Grid Attack. Grid Attack is this game's version of Battleship, and I'm going to say right now that this is one of the most annoying, tedious games in the pack. It is awful. I loathe it each time I get to this point because the game lasts forever and it's down to just pure luck. And do you want to know why that is? Do you see these squares? These are your ships. Do you notice how two of them are only one by one square large? Do you know why the real Battleship game does not have one tile boats? The reason is because if you have a one tile ship, you wouldn't be able to infer where your opponent's ship is, and you'd have to guess on literally every single tile on the board. Having not just one, but two of these one square boats ruins this game. If you're going to do a multiplayer of this one, I suggest making a house rule where the two one squares need to stay together and form their own ship, or else it's about as luck based as Candyland or War. And unlike Old Maid, which is also luck based here, this one takes for goddamn ever as you need to play through the entire animation. You have a special attacks that hit a 3x1 grid, but it still isn't helpful when literally any tile can hold a square. Game 8. Word Balloon. Word Balloon is Hangman. You're given a fairly high level word. The word I got was Abolition. Yeah, the game is rated like E10, but it's clear that they weren't aiming for just kids with this one. Anyway, all players try to guess the same word. You can see the letters they got wrong, but not the letters they got right. Although you can see how many letters that they did get right. Uh, this is one of those unlockable games. Win it, and then you could play it whenever. Game 9, Memory. It's a memory matching game, nothing complex or interesting to speak of here. Game 10, Turncoat. This is a game that I'm really bad at. I think this is one that I lost a few times. Anyway, the players take turns placing their color pieces on the board. If you surround a line of your opponent's pieces, it becomes your color. Whoever has more by the end of the game wins. All that I really know is that you should aim for having your tiles on the corners, and then the edges, because those can never be converted. But that's all the strategy I got here. Pig is a game that I don't really like. Players trade cards until one player gets four of a kind, and every player tries to move a coin to the center. There's always one less coin than player, and if you're not the one that gets the four of a kind, you're probably going to lose. Luckily, it's like the quickest game in the pack, so losing three times in a row isn't tedious. Game 12, Bowling. Bowling was the moment where this game got out of the adaptation box, as it were. As I've said, if a video game can be replicated with just a deck of cards or whatever, it's very hard for me to consider it a must-play. And while, yes, you can play bowling in real life, it's cool to have it right on your DS. It isn't as good as, say, Wii Sports, but that's to be expected. The bowling mechanics here take some time to get used to, but after a while, it really does quick. At the very least, it's consistent. A criticism I can see is that you've only got one lane that you just play 10 times. However, in free play, if you win any of these games, 5, 10, or 15 times, you'll unlock different backgrounds. It's mostly aesthetic, and I really wish that the digital skin used actual vector graphics instead of pixel wireframes, but it's a nice thing to have rewards for you playing more. I can imagine this one might be tedious to lose, though, because you do have to play the whole 10 lane game every single time. Last card is kinda stupid. Get rid of all the cards in your hand by playing a card of the same suit that's been placed on the table. If you got the highest card in your last run, you pick the suit. If you can't play a card, draw until you can. On its own, it's fine, but some other games on this compilation make it quite redundant. Hey, did you know the dominoes were actually made for like an actual real game they're not just made to be tipping over well i actually assume that they're like a deck of cards that can be used in many different games here's what you have to do for this game though make a line of them every time both the ends end in a multiple of five you get that amount of points divided by five if you have a double domino it's turned sideways and can start its own line this game is actually pretty fun and it's a nice idea for dominoes there's one problem though the game keeps going until you earn 61 points and in an entire round you maybe can earn like three of them. This takes a while. This game took me like 15 minutes. And remember, if you want to unlock everything in Clubhouse games, you're going to need to win this game 15 times for the extra skins, and three times for the three different stamp modes. Game 15. Last card plus is Uno, which is Crazy 8s. Actually, I'd like to apologize what I said in the Uno episode, about how it was just Crazy 8s with power-ups. Crazy 8s actually has power-ups. Ace is a turn skip, 2 forces your opponent to draw 2 cards, 3 forces your opponent to draw 3 cards, and 9 reverses turn order, well, with the 8 actually being a wild card. 
Last Card Plus, or Crazy Aids as I call it, is a fine game in its own right, but if I do have a criticism here, it's that you can't turn off card abilities, even in free play mode. Like, you can't make the twos not force your opponent to draw two cards. And when, like, half the deck is a power-up, the game can become a little long and frustrating. Blackjack. Blackjack is blackjack. Yeah, Clubhouse Games has simulated gambling, which is why it's rated E10 or 12 plus in Europe. And this is the only reason. I, I don't know what else to say about blackjack, except this game uses negative numbers. So you can bet more chips than you have, and at the end, the highest number just wins. Game 17, and our second unlockable, Ludo. Ludo is traditionally known as Pachisi. Pachisi was always a go-to game for me of a game that I didn't know how to play, but when I learned how to play Ludo here, I realized that I actually do know how to play Pachisi. In the United States, at least, there are like five different brand names that the same game has been released under, uh, just with slightly different mechanics. It's been known as Sorry, Trouble, Aggravation, and Parcheesy. Although my favorite name for it is the German brand name, which literally translates to Man, Don't Get Upset. So, both players keep rolling until someone gets a six. Get a six and you can bring your piece onto the board, trying to get it all the way around until it gets home, which must be achieved with an exact number. However, if one player lands on another player's piece, that target player must send their piece back to the start, which requires a six to get out of. In my playthrough, the computer got shit luck and wasn't able to roll a six for like the first two dozen turns. Luckily, in free play mode, you can turn this rule off or change it up, like having one piece start outside the starting area. Just keep in mind that the you have to roll a six rule does add some strategy to the game, and it's a rule that is there for a reason. I do wish that Clubhouse Games had other move pieces around the board type board games, considering there are so many of them in the real world. But considering how popular this one is and how popular it is to rebrand, I can't say that they chose wrong. Game 18, Hearts. Hearts is that other game like Minesweeper that was always on the PC, but I didn't know how to play. But since Clubhouse Games teaches you how to play, I now know how to play Hearts. I, I don't know how to win, mind you, but I do know the basic rules of the game now. Game 19, Hasami Shogi. Honestly, this is one of my favorite games of the whole package, and I didn't know that it existed beforehand. So each one of your pieces can move horizontal or vertical as far as you want to go. When your pieces surround your opponent's pieces, you capture them. And by surround, I mean you can capture a whole line of them. It's really simple, really easy to learn, but there's a lot of depth here. Game 20, President. I would talk more about President, but I want this video to remain advertiser friendly, so let's move on. Game 21, Balance. Balance is pretty much a reverse Jenga. There's a scale and players take turns placing a piece with ragdoll physics onto that scale. Last one out wins. It's actually really enjoyable. I was even able to complete the challenge in which you had to stack 20 pieces without tipping the scale over. Game 22, Checkers! If you've never played Checkers before, stop lying to me, you play Checkers. Unfortunately, this is Force Capture Checkers. I don't care if it's more traditional or the way Checkers is meant to be played. Forcing me to capture the other player's pieces when I don't want to doesn't make the game more fun and I've never met anyone who thinks so. I get that it's a tournament rule, but this game isn't a Checkers tournament game. And besides, it would be nice to at least have the option to turn it off. Game 23, Rummy. This is a fun and simple game. Empty your hands by creating groups of three or more cards or poker runs of three or more. Don't know what else to say about it though. Oh yeah, this is one of those games that forces more than one round, three in this case. So if you lose after playing three games, it can kind of be obnoxious. Mahjong Solitaire. I think that most people know how to play this game. Collect matching tiles. You can only collect said tiles if they are open on one of their sides and don't have a piece on top of each other. In free play, it's quite enjoyable. There are 10 layouts. As something in stamp mode, it's kind of a joke because you can keep pressing hint again and again until you win. Also, keep in mind that in Solitaire games, you have to win. You can't just lose it three times and move on to the next one because you can't lose. So you might be stuck on some of them for a while. Game 25, Field Tactics. Uh, this is an interesting strategy game that I think was actually made for Clubhouse Games. The basic idea is to capture your enemy's base, but every single piece has its own abilities. It's kind of an analog to a much, much faster risk. It's fun, but it would take me way too long to explain it as I'd have to talk about what every single piece does. It, th there's some fun strategy though. Uh, game 26, Takeover. This is like a fun shuffleboarding, actually. You knock your piece around the table, claiming territories. Uh, and the physics are kind of like an ice hockey puck, if I had to describe it. If you knock yourself off, all your titles become neutral again. However, if you knock off your opponent, all their territories become yours. So, the more you're winning by, the more of a target you are. Whoever has the most points at the end of 10 turns wins. Game 27, Seven Bridge. 
Okay, so last card was to last card plus as Rummy is to Seven Bridge. It's the same game really, just with a little more complexity. I didn't have much to say about the first one, so I don't have to say much here. Uh, chess. Chess is chess. It was easily the most mandatory inclusion, like, this compilation series would probably be terrible if it didn't have chess. I, I don't really have many complaints here. Well, except for one that I've noticed, but this applies to all the games. Clubhouse Games always randomly chooses who goes first, even when you're playing against the computer and even if you're doing it in free play. You can't force yourself to go first or even second. And with chess, it's kind of important, as people do determine entire strategies based on whether they go first or second. And in most games, it usually doesn't matter, but it would have been nice to have the option. It really would have. Also, this game will automatically end in a stalemate if there's too much repetition, so the game will not go on forever. Game 29, five card draw poker. Yep, it, it's five card draw poker. Less popular version of it. Although, I, I do appreciate that it's here. It seems like even poker games tend to neglect this version. Like the Poker Night at the Inventory series, for instance. Poker Night 2 has Omaha and Texas Hold'em, but no five card draw. I, I don't care if it's like an, an unpopular version. Every poker game should at least have the option to play this. Speaking of that, once again, this game uses negative numbers, so no one is knocked out of the poker tournament. Whoever has the most chips at the end of five games wins, which is a really odd way of doing this. Chinese checkers. Well, once again, it's Chinese checkers. If I had a nitpick, I wish you could change the game pieces to marbles, because that's how I'm used to playing Chinese checkers, but otherwise it's fine. Uh, game 31, nap. Try and get the most tricks by playing the highest card or the trump suit. Three rounds. Uh, moving on. Connect five. Uh, because Connect 4 is copyrighted. Get five pieces in a row before your opponent does. Basically, Tic Tac Tofu is a real game. Uh, Solitaire is Solitaire. It's interesting how they're putting most of the classic, well-known games, like, at the end here, or towards the end of the middle. In free play mode, you can have the deck draw one card, but in the stamp mode, you need to draw three cards. And once again, you have to keep playing until you win. If you're bad at this version of Solitaire, uh, you might be stuck here for quite a bit. Game 34, Shogi. And another unlockable, I think this is the last one. Shogi is also known as Chinese Chess, and it's a game that, once again, I don't really know how to play. I'll probably be able to learn about it when I get some spare time, but right now, it would probably take more time than I'm willing to invest. I, I do definitely want to learn how to play Shogi someday, though. And now I have the means, I guess. Shogi is an ancient game with a lot of depth and strategy, and I can't stand not knowing how to play games like this, that are this famous. Also, it really is good on them for including Shogi. Uh, that's not an easy answer to include, I think. It's not what I see played in most clubhouses, but it certainly is an all-time classic. But like I said, if you want to play Shogi, you'll need to play through pretty much every one of the other games first. Game 35, Darts. Hit the bullseye better than your opponent. Like with bowling, it takes a bit to get used to, but it is consistent. And it's not the same as bowling, so you'll need to recalibrate yourself. Piece of advice, toss the darts lightly. If you throw the darts too hard, the thing will miss its mark every single time. Game 36, Texas Hold'em. Poker round two. Second verse, same as the first. It won't light your world on fire, but it was another mandatory inclusion, I think, especially if they already had five card draw. And I might fill you in on what kind of clubhouse the title actually refers to. And then we have Koi Koi, my least favorite game in the entire package. Unless you're Japanese, this game is going to be a major pace breaker, because you've never heard of this game before, and nothing looks intuitive. It doesn't even use a standard deck of cards. In a sense, it's like randomly throwing in Magic the Gathering, which, yes, is a, is a great game, don't get me wrong, but it takes a lot of learning and the general normies don't have to play it. And it's not something that you'd look to in a game like this. It'd probably be better on in its own game. Koi Koi is played with Japanese Hanafuda cards, which, fun fact, Nintendo used to make back in the 1800s, which explains why this game is here. It's the only reason this game is here, because this game should not have been here. The deck's cards are very beautiful, I will say. It's divided into 12 suits, and what makes up each suit isn't as obvious as, say, them all having the same shape. Each suit is based on a particular month of the year, and some of these associations have been lost in translation. I would have to study and memorize each card to learn what makes each of the suits. Some of them are more obvious than others, yes, but not all of them are. And considering that Koi Koi is a game about matching these cards, if the game didn't tell me when a pair was available, I'd probably have never beat this. I would just be randomly clicking on shit. And I know what you're thinking, it's not so bad, just lose three times and move on to the next game. And that's what I usually do when I get to this point. But here's the problem. Each game of Koi Koi lasts for 12 
fucking rounds. And each round can go on a while. I'm lucky that I beat this one on accident my first try, but every time I get here, it's just frustration. Yes, the rules are available and easily accessible, but sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. They should not have included this game. The audience is too niche, and it takes too long to learn for casual play. Game 38, Spades. After Koi Koi, I was a little bit tired, so I didn't bother learning how to play this one. One thing about this one, though, is that if you don't bet on, many, on how many tricks you're going to get and keep passing, sometimes the game plays itself. Anyway, I lost this one and brute forced it. I'm sure that Spades is a great game, and I'll be coming back to learn most of the games that I haven't gotten to in the first playthrough. But right now, we're, we're getting close to the end, and I am quite tired. Game 39 is Billiards, and by Billiards, they mean 9-ball, because I guess the table is too small to render all 18 balls. So both players try and hit the 1-ball until it goes in, and then the 2-ball until it goes in, all the way up to the 9-ball. However, if you, let's say, hit the 1-ball into the 9-ball, and the 9-ball goes in, you win! It's a weird form of billiards, and I've never played a version like this before. Uh, game 40, Contact Bridge. Uh, we're in the final stretch here. Here's a tip, don't play even on easy mode in this game in one long marathon. Clubhouse games is a casual game. Play it in bursts, or you're gonna start going through games without really a clue as to what you're doing, like I did here. Game 41, Baggammon. Backgammon is the other traditional game that I always wished I could play. It was like always right there on the other side of these portable chess boards, and I always knew that I like should learn how to play this game. And thanks to Clubhouse games, I do. I actually took the time to learn how to play this one because I was actually interested. I also learned that I'm not very good at backgammon. It's actually a lot of fun though, getting all your pieces all the way back around the board home. I don't know if it's like as popular as chess, I think it might only be on the other side of those chess boards because it's like public domain or something. Uh, but still, it's a fun game. However, this is a weird accusation, but I think the computer was actually cheating on this one. And from the other times I played Clubhouse games, I always remember RNG being a little bit biased during this game. My dice rolls always seem to be just the wrong ones. The only number that would get me stuck in this move was a 2, so I rolled double 2s. Towards the end of the game, when it mattered, the computer opponent kept rolling doubles. If you don't know, in Backgammon, if you roll doubles, you basically move twice. They rolled doubles three times in a row, and the first time that they didn't roll doubles, like the fourth time in the sequence, is because there were only two pieces left on the board, so they didn't need any more doubles. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's just me, I don't know if I got unlucky or whatever, but uh, the RNG seems to be absolutely hell in this game. Which is odd, because none of the other games are like this. And finally, Game 42, Escape. I make a joke about how that sounds like a really good idea, but for, but for the most part, I've actually enjoyed the time that I've spent on Clubhouse games. Escape is a sliding block puzzle. Get the crown block out of the puzzle, plain and simple. Free play has 20 different puzzles, and completing one in stamp mode actually counts towards that. Speaking of completion, we are done with Clubhouse games. And now for the verdict. I may have seemed a bit winded towards the end, but Clubhouse games is a yes. It is one of the best compilation games that I have ever played. While not all the games are quote-unquote all-time classics, I have enjoyed my time with the sheer variety. In fact, believe it or not, I actually bought Clubhouse games based on the book's recommendations. It's just been a while since I played it, so I needed a bit of a reminder. I got the European version for some reason, but besides the title, it's the same game. And luckily, it seems like the DS isn't region locked. Clubhouse games is actually one of my first choices for bringing to, say, the dentist's office over something that I played on the 3DS, like even Animal Crossing New Leaf. Because the games are short, and if I get bored of one, I could easily jump to another. I honestly wish that this was the pack and title for the original DS. It better serves to show its functionality than, say, Dogs, which was the actual pack and title. Clubhouse Games has fun games on the go, there's touch interactivity, it's enjoyable single player, uh, but multiplayer makes it even better. I guess the only issue with making it the pack and title is that you might not want a game with gambling in it to sell your console. But yes, it's a yes without hesitation at this point. And I will give the book a point for introducing me to this game. This is the stuff that I'm looking for in the book. Hidden little gems that people otherwise wouldn't find. I mean, it's not like it was lauded by the critics or anything, but really, but what really cements it for me is not just the amount of games, but the fact that it does teach you how to play. And when that is combined with the variety, it can help you become a more well-rounded person. If even in a small way. Games can help bring people together if you want to go out of the way and learn the language of them. 
If there's a caveat, I would say that there really isn't much of a point to emulating this game. If you really, really are interested, it, it's worth going out and actually buying it, because if you want to play, like, Shackers on your PC, there are, there are many better options.